Hey everyone, welcome back to Trek on the Tube. It's done. It's over. It's finished. Season 1 of Star Trek Lower Decks has come to an end, and I strongly believe it is the best first season of the franchise, hands down. You know, in only 10 episodes, it did so much, but no, 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 we're not talking about that right now. We're going to keep all that for the season review that I have coming later right now. Today, we're talking specifically about Season 1, Episode 10, No Small Parts. This is my review. These are the Easter eggs. Let's go. It was a great episode. As usual, like with every other episode we've had, there are those that claim it's the best of the season, and although I don't think I'd go that far because, well, premieres and finales always seem to have a certain hype about them, I will maintain it was a great episode, not only in its own right, but also as a finale to this first season. I particularly enjoyed how the story opened itself up to new possibilities, new dynamics, new situations, by delivering big surprises, but still managed to feel like an end. Of course, the show had already been greenlit for two seasons at launch, but had this been the only season for the show, the final episode would have worked fine as a conclusion. And that's not an easy thing to accomplish. Alright, so doing reviews isn't always easy because balancing the subjective and objective is a peculiar exercise. Sometimes it's harder than others when, for example, a character I enjoyed in another show comes back and they're completely different. On one hand, my personal feelings push all else aside and questions arise. Why did they do this? Why did they make my character say that? What the hell is going on? Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. On the other hand, it's important to know how to take a step back and look at the decisions that were made in regards to the character based on the context of the new show. Oh hey, turns out it might make sense that this character has grown and changed in such a way. Now this subjective objective balancing act applies to every aspect of every show, but sometimes it's harder to handle than others. With this particular episode, it's... <laughs> it's not easy at all. Here's the thing. I have been writing amateur Star Trek scripts for a while, and I have been brainstorming new Star Trek show ideas for even longer. I also had personal theories and predictions about Lower Decks itself, and somehow, Mike McMahon broke into my home and probed my mind during the night because he put both my predictions for his show and my ideas for my own Star Treks all in this same episode. I knew Riker would show up 100%. And he did. I knew Dr. Ta'ana had a thing for Shax and she confirmed it. I desperately wanted a crossover between the animated series and Lower Decks, drawn in their respective art styles, and this counts. It counts. I'm counting it. I don't want to hear it. <laughs> it counts. Furthermore, the way I've always envisioned at least one of my Star Trek shows is episodic in nature on a Starfleet ship, and to have those scenes before the title sequence take place on planets we've already been to in the original series. Dear God, would I love to revisit the planet from the Devil in the Dark, for example, just to see how things have progressed. I've also always been a fan of the Packleds and wanted to bring them back in some way. I even mentioned them in my Trek Chat discussion about Star Trek villains. To my own ridicule, point is, this episode did all of those things, and, and more. It, it got real personal, so of course I loved the episode. Staying objective is very difficult, come on. Now, if I were to truly try and stay objective about it, granted, I would be less overtly enthused, but I still maintain the story is solid, and the writing was so good. There was a fantastic use of so many familiar elements. I mean, seriously, they brought back the exocomps and managed to not only enrich the backstory of these little sentient robots, but also present a different angle to the original story in which they were featured. We got, as we just mentioned, a follow-up, to an iconic original series episode accompanied by commentary exploring the faults of Starfleet and the Federation. And then, Lower Decks, the first Star Trek comedy show, took one of the biggest jokes from the next generation, arguably the most grown-up Star Trek show, and made them into legitimately threatening villains, flipping the whole thing on its head. The joke show took the joke thing from the serious show and made it the serious thing. You gotta love this. And even if you don't, you have to admire the elegance with which all of these feats were accomplished. I mean, Star Trek Lower Decks just makes it look easy. The use of the, the, the universe and the way the comedy is weaved into it is seamless. <laughs> I hate Badgie. <laughs> I know, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to spring it on you like this, but 
We also have to address what was wrong with the episode, or what I didn't like. And look, I, I wasn't very much a fan of his first appearance to begin with. Uh, some stuff worked, sure, but on the whole, I thought he was part of one of the weaker outings of the season, and he himself wasn't the detail that would help pick the episode up. So, seeing him again wasn't something I was looking forward to. I was expecting him, though, uh, granted not so soon, more like season 2, but I knew he'd come back. Anyway, yeah, Badgie. Eh. I could have done without him. Oh, and the other thing I didn't like, brace yourselves, people, because this is the controversial thing that I've been mentioning and that I've been teasing uh, on the Twitters. <clears throat> Jonathan Frakes' voice acting. It wasn't very good. I know, I know. Look, I was overjoyed to see Riker and Troy back in yet another Star Trek show, in animated form no less. I have no problem with that. On the contrary, it was so fun. Jonathan Frakes, however, the man behind the character, I mean... I mean, he's a great actor, don't get me wrong. And he's a wonderful director. He's actually also a terrific voice actor. He's great in Gargoyles, but his performance in this episode specifically was just off. He actively struggled at delivering some of his lines. He said Boimler wrong. Anyway. It didn't ruin the episode, and it wasn't outright bad voice acting. I was simply expecting better. Added to the fact it probably contrasts with everyone else's flawless performance, I was disappointed. But that's it for my complaints, because let's face it, everything else was just awesome. The animation, the directing, the score, the action. Because yes, No Small Parts was more action-adventure than it was comedy, which is fine in my book. I mean, yeah, everything was solid. Shax died. Boimler left, and Rutherford's memory got wiped. I don't want to get into this too much, because most of what I could say about these three big takeaways will need to be addressed in my season review, but the episode was bold and brave to take such big steps, and yeah, I wanted to talk about it, at le I wanted to at least mention it. I mean, as it stands, until we see where all of this leads, all three of these surprises were flawlessly executed, bittersweet story beats. Actually, no, scratch that. Shax dying and Boimler leaving. Those were flawless. Rutherford losing his memory could have been, I don't know, a bit better. His friends seemed a bit too unaffected for my taste. Still, still very interesting. And, uh, yeah. Alright, that's it for the review. A solid episode and a strong finish to an impressive first season. Let's talk Easter eggs and references, starting with that original series tie-in in the beginning. The crew is on Beta 3, explaining to the planet's inhabitants that they are not supposed to be worshipping a sentient computer. All of this has been seen before, as it was kind of explained in the episode. In the original series, in an episode called The Return of the Archons, Kirk and his crew discover that on Beta 3, the inhabitants have come to worship a computer called Landru. Now, it's a completely deranged situation, especially considering the planet has something called the Red Hour, which is essentially a, a purge. Yes, that's right, like those movies. The whole concept of having a specific moment when all laws are abolished and people can do whatever they want, Star Trek invented it. Suffice to say, Kirk and friends save the day and leave, but apparently, up until now, no one ever checked up on the planet again, and so 100 years later, things have just gone back to how they were before. I, I wouldn't even call this an easter egg or a reference. This is just brilliant world building, as is this photograph of Kirk and Spock, supposedly taken during the original series episode, but done here in the art style of the animated series. This is all so good. Anyway, when Freeman and Ransom get back to the ship, the captain mentions the Gamesters of Triskelion, which is a callback to another original series episode, and Ransom uses in a very meta joke the acronym TOS when talking about that period in time. TOS in universe is said to mean those old scientists in the mind of Ransom, but of course for us fans it simply means the original series. The Packleds, villains of this episode, were originally introduced in The Next Generation, and yes, they were as dumb in that show as they were here. They do look very much the same, as do their ships and technology. Before being attacked, the Solvang was patrolling the Kala system, which is an area of space belonging to the Packleds, also mentioned before in The Next Generation. The Solvang, by the way, is yet another California-class ship named after a California city. Moving on to even more Next Generation references, this is William Riker, this is Deanna Troy. They were main cast on that show. Both of them have been seen in many iterations over the years, but I won't go into too much detail as to not spoil too much. I will say one thing though, both characters are seen wearing their respective wedding rings, and that was a nice touch. They arrive on the USS Titan, which is a ship mentioned in Nemesis, as well as earlier in this season 
of Lower Decks. The ship design, the Luna class, has actually existed in the non-canon extended universe for quite a while now and has been a fan favorite for years. Finally now, it has made it into the official Star Trek story. Aboard the Titan we can see a Saurian, which is a species first seen in, I think, the motion picture or one of those movies, but we saw one in Discovery. And the crew is wearing those first contact slash Deep Space Nine uniforms that we've actually already seen before in Lower Decks in Mariner's flashback. When the Titan arrives to save the day, the Next Generation theme can be heard very loudly. And when the episode ends, Riker orders the ship to jump to warp by doing a four- five six bit which is a reference to his love of jazz to finish off with will and diana they both discuss little risa and their holgan because the titan is off to tolgana 4 if you recall tolgana 4 and little risa were featured earlier in this season of lower decks and the holgan that the couple are talking about are these little statues that the risen people are so fond of oh let's not forget the enterprise references Riker mentions he was in the holodeck watching a recreation of Archer's ship. This, of course, is something that he did in that very show. He also drops a not-so-subtle, they had a long road getting from there to here, which are an iconic part of the lyrics to Enterprise's main theme. Other Next Generation references include Captain Freeman Day, a callback to Captain Picard Day, Wesley Crusher working with his mom, Wesley and Beverly were main-slash-recurring characters on that show, Armis, the big sludge thing that kills people, and the exocomps, that we talked about earlier. There's also a mention of Wolf 359, which is the name of a battle against the Borg. The same person that mentions Wolf 359 also talks about the Dominion War and the Changelings, which are a seriously big part of Deep Space Nine and are not conspiracies. <laughs> Among the more random easter eggs, we get a mention of First Contact Day Salmon. This is a reference to the events of the movie First Contact, although the celebratory salmon is new. Billups is seen holding this helmet, which is also new to canon, even if it's been a big joke within the Star Trek fandom for years now. It was a toy back in the 70s or, or something. It was sold as a Star Trek toy, but of course had never been featured on the show, so it was completely stupid. Until now. Now it's a serious prop. Come on. During that sequence, Ransom pulls out some more Kirk Fu double fist punch moves, referencing Kirk's combat style from the original series. Boimler is seen with a sword, probably referencing the Lower Decks pilot, where Mariner says they're due for a new sword guy, and the final reference, which isn't really one at all, is this captain. She was seen earlier in the season being just as useless as she was here. And, uh, didn't pay off. She died. So did her crew. And that's all of it. So many things to talk about. Oh my god, I'll tell you what, I love Lower Decks, but the references part of each video is so intimidating to write because there's just so much. Anyway, we'll be done for a while. Thank you so much for watching. Please do subscribe, leave a comment, share with the people that you know. Please consider becoming a patron, like all of these wonderful people. It really helps out the channel and goes a long way. Oh, and uh, boom. It's October, which means the Trek on the Tube Halloween 2020 shirt is available. Get one! They're amazing, they're funny, they're unique, they were imagined by Trekker Prize and myself and brought to life by his incredible artistic talents. It's a limited run, people, so get them quick. When October's over, so are the shirts. This is the 2019 design, by the way, and there's a little trick on the tube. October, well, Halloween 2019 written on the back. There'll be 2020 written on the other one as to make them unique. Anyway, this also designed by Trekker Prize. He's great, check him out, he's amazing. All right, that's it. See you soon. Live long and prosper.